Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to True Stream. My name is Mike Hesh, and today is, let's see, December 30th. So I think a happy new year is in order for you uh, a couple days in advance, but uh, happy new year. And I'm expecting this year to be an awesome year. And uh, don't have any announcements for you. We will have a new guest speaker in January. Uh, and I'm not sure who that is. If I knew, I don't remember now. So anyway, I just want to thank you for joining me. And, um, you know, it's been an awesome year. Uh, think about it for a moment. All the wonderful things that our father has shared with us through this stream and uh, through Healing Journeys today. Uh, it is, wow, it has been awesome. And uh we get through healing journeys today. We get testimonies all the time uh, from folks like yourself that have been impacted uh, and uh, blessed and edified and healed and delivered and set free uh, because of the truth that they're hearing through this platform. And uh, boy, it just blesses me. It's an encouragement to me. You know, my father told our father told me that to just share the things that he shared with me. And he said, the truth, the truth in those things that set me free, if people will receive them, they'll be set free too. And so that's just my encouragement. I, I remind myself of that every single day, that it's the truth that makes us free. So why would I speak anything else? Amen? So today I have an awesome study for us are an awesome message. Uh, every time I think about this, I get so blessed because it's actually everywhere in the Word. Uh, this topic I'm talking about is our focus can heal us or hurt us. And uh, boy, it is so true. Uh, just a quick testimony. Uh, I used to be on the prayer line at Andrew Womack Ministries. And uh, I would get calls from people that were, you know, in extreme situations. Like, for example, um, I would get people that would call in and they would be just totally, you know, in pain. And they would say to me, I would ask them, I'd say, well, what's your pain on a scale? You know, one to 10. Oh, it's 14 or 15, you know, they'd say. And, and, uh, and I'd say, okay. Well, uh, and I would begin to share the word of God with them. And uh, when they became engaged or changed their focus from their pain to what was being shared with them, it would be, you know, five, 10 minutes into the conversation. And all of a sudden I could discern that they were not as anxious. They were not as distraught. They were, they were beginning to be focused on the word. They were, gonna, they were beginning to respond to the truth. And I would stop them and I'd say, now what's your pain now? And I'd always have to tell them. I'd say, now don't go looking for it. And, uh, and they'd say, oh, well, gosh, it's probably a, you know, a five or a six. You know, I can handle that, you know. But uh, the point I want to make is once their focus moved away, from what uh, from their their circumstance or from the pain or their situation, whatever how you want to word it, and they began to refocus on what the Word of God was saying. Wow, it made a difference for them. It completely changed them, not just emotionally or or spiritually. What it did was it actually affected their physical body. Wow, I have an, I have an awesome uh, testimony. You know, if any of you haven't seen my testimony online about the healing that I experienced, wow, uh, the, some of the truths I'm going to share here today, uh, man, think about my situation. I had a big old tumor on my chest and a uh, cancerous tumor and everything that goes with cancer, I was experiencing. You know, every, you name it, I had it. And there was no relief. 24-7 it was there. And because it was, because when 
it didn't start off that way. It started off as something small. But I began, when it was small and insignificant, I began to focus on it. And I would keep looking at it every day, you know, like, uh, you know, okay, is it get, getting better, you know, or, or uh, I'd read something and then I'd, you know, speak it over it, or I'd take something and, you know, a few days later, I'd say, is it working? I kept my fo focus constantly on the sickness and the disease. And you know what happened as a result of that? It stayed there. It never went away. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a law uh, in this world in which we live in, whatever you focus on, you magnify. And that's exactly what was happening to me. As I was focusing on the sickness and disease, it was not only taking my attention, but it was taking my life too. In other words, I was filtering everything through what was going on in my physical body. Was I getting better? Okay. Does it look better? Does it look worse? You know, all that was constantly in my mind, uh, thinking about that. And, uh, th you know, uh, l let me just, uh, I have many testimonies from people I minister to, but l let me just use this one. It's a common for all of us. You know, let's say you're going along, you're in good shape, you feel great, and then all of a sudden you have a pain somewhere, or you have a feeling or a, or a symptom pops up in your body, okay? Now, there's many ways you can handle that, but what happens is most people will, the moment they take notice of it, they begin to focus on it, okay? Now, uh, I've had people that have shared testimonies with me that, you know, uh, they read something about their body because they had a little pain or a little symptom. So they go read about some natural thing to help them. And then they start taking that natural thing, that supplement, that vitamin, that food. And uh, pretty soon they're taking so much of it that thinking that's going to help, that it actually begins to hurt their body. Not realizing all along that the enemy might just be setting them up with that pain. In other words, if the enemy can set you up and say, oh, feel that pain? Oh, it's this. And then you go and start taking something that he suggested to make you better, <laughs> What's going to happen? Well, you're going to get worse, not better, because he's never going to tell you anything that gives life. He's going to tell you something that will get you in over your head. Yeah, below the water where you cannot breathe, where you're constantly thinking about surviving and you can't think about anything else or so you think. Now, the testimony I just shared about callers that would call in. Now, this wasn't a rarity. This wasn't just once in a while people would call in and have this. This was a daily occurrence. And through this, I realized, because I, I saw it in my own life, I realized that this is something common with everyone. That, that if something comes to our mind and we begin to give it focus or we have a respect for it, uh, above everything else, it's going to take our attention away. And we're going to be trying to deal with, mitigate, fix, repair, whatever that problem is, our mind is fixed on it. You know, I have a teaching on, um, on my website. It's called Carefree or Careful. And, uh, and, in that teaching, I talk about how the enemy uses just very subtle little things to get our mind, our attention away from what is really true about us to a care. And if we get our mind on that care, what, it's going, what is it going to do? Once our focus is on it, it's going to take our attention away from what's really going to help us or really be a benefit to us. I use this example all the time because it illustrates the point so well. You know, we cannot look in two opposite directions at the same time, okay? I have a right hand and I have a left hand, or a left hand and a right hand, okay? Now, if I'm looking all the way to my right hand, 
I can, I don't know what's going on over here. You know what I mean? Uh, I have no idea because I cannot see it. And when, as the more intently I focus on this, the less I am aware of this, even though it may be connected to my body where I feel it, I am still focused on this. It has my attention and therefore this is not affecting me over here. You know, God created us that way. He created us with the ability to focus to the exclusion of other things, okay? And he did it that way intentionally because, you know, God is single-minded. He is very focused. He only has focus on one thing, and that is life. God doesn't focus on anything else. And every action or means in his life is to that end, okay? It's not that he isn't aware of other things. It's that his focus is on life because he is spirit and he is life. So he manifests that in every single thing he do does and he never lets anything take his focus away from that. And it's an example that you and I can follow because we were created in his image. So we have that capacity. Think about it for a moment. My wife will get on me about this. When I'm focused on something, uh, it's hard for me to be distracted, okay? Like if I'm, you know, if I'm uh, reading something, uh, my wife can be hollering at me or, you know, asking me questions. And I may not even notice that she's there asking me or talking to me because I'm focused on something. That's very important to me. Think about this. Many people, they'll be watching a television show or, or a, a movie or something. And, you know, there's a lot going around. Think about being in a theater, okay? There's many people around you. But at some point within that movie, you've lost all consciousness of the people around you, okay? You're really into that movie. That's why, you know, in a scary movie, when, you know, the guy's head pops up, you know, everybody just jumps back, you know, and they're not thinking, well, I wouldn't do that. That's just a stupid movie. Why would I be scared at a movie? But you don't stop to think about that. You become so focused and so engaged in that, that it has your undivided attention. Emphasis on undivided. You know, the Bible tells us that that when we are single-minded, that is the same as being steadfast. And steadfastness is what we use to appropriate or take what God has made available to us through Christ Jesus. If you're born again, it already belongs to you. So you can focus on that to the exclusion of other things. And that's called faith, being steadfast. You know, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, let, let's just turn there and read it. I could quote it to you, but I would like to read it again. Listen to what this says here. It's a, it's a beautiful passage. It was very helpful for me. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, We look not at the things which are seen. Just stop there for a minute. We look not at the things which are seen. How do you not look at the things that you can see? Stop, just think about that for a second. How do you not look at something you can see? Now, it gets better. Listen to what it says. But we look at the things which are not seen. So how do you see something you cannot see? Listen carefully. It says, for the things which are seen are temporary or temporal, or you could say of the world or of the flesh. It says, but the things which are not seen are eternal, or you could say spiritual. So the, what this is sharing is that we can't, we have the ability to focus in the spirit on things that we cannot see. And it tells us that we also have the ability to not focus on things that we can see. It says, for we look not. See, that shows that we have a choice in what our focus is. You know, you might say, yeah, but if, 
you know, if something scares you, you, you know, it just got your attention and da, 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 you can't avoid that. Well, the Bible covers that too. It says, don't be afraid of sudden fear. Sudden fear can come to anyone or, or something can be thrown up in our face, but we don't have to focus on it, folks. We can focus on what God says about it. In fact, we are told this, if you read on down to ch in chapter five, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, you can have something that comes to your attention. Let's go back to symptoms. You can have a symptom that pops up in your body, but you have a choice. You can either look at what the word of God says about it and have and focus on what God is saying about it, or you can focus on what you think about it or what you think is necessary. But the moment the enemy gets your attention in the flesh, then he's going to start telling you what you need to do to get rid of it, be better, move it out of your life, or get more. And once you get there, the enemy tries to keep you there by keeping it before your mind, keeping it before your eyes, keeping it in your radar, so to speak. Okay? That's why I tell people, don't ignore the symptoms. Just don't focus on them. You know, ignoring is not the same as uh, letting go of or forsaking or not paying attention to, okay? Ignoring is you've got it on the back burner and you're aware of it and you've got one eye kind of on it, but you're not going to acknowledge it. That's, that's ignoring. We don't want to ignore anything. Jesus said, oh, it's just the devil, ignore him. No, he didn't say that. He's, he told us, and he addressed the thoughts of the devil when the devil spoke to him. He didn't say, oh, that's not true. Or like when we were kids, la, 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 la. No, he addressed the thought to keep his focus where it was to start with. The enemy's thoughts, think of the temptation in the wilderness. The enemy's thoughts were designed to draw Jesus away from what he had already established in his heart. But he was aware of that. So he compared it to what he could not see. He comp I mean, he compared what he was hearing and seeing in his mind to what he knew was true, what couldn't be seen in that moment. But in his heart, he could see it because he had established his heart in it. Therefore, when the enemy brought him a different picture or a different uh, scenario, what did he default to? He defaulted to what he knew was true and real because he had seen it in his own heart. He had seen it from the word. He had embraced it, uh, the truth. And that's why he knew it was true, because truth brings freedom. It's an awesome point. So think about this. Whatever we're focusing on is... Uh, going to be sowing something into our life. You know, the Bible says in, uh, let's just turn there, we're so close, in uh, Galatians uh, chapter 6. Uh, it's a good, has many applications, but uh, this, listen to this. It says, verse 8 of uh, Galatians chapter, well, verse 7. It says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, that's not saying God's up there making sure that you have a harvest. You know, whatever, okay, you looked at that, you're going to get that. No, God's not up there doing that. God established a law. This is part of the, the uh, when I said earlier, there's a law that's been established. Whatever we focus on, we magnify. And uh, this, is, this is part of that truth that whatever you're sowing to is going to produce a harvest because every seed reproduces after its own kind. That's a law. And so notice what it goes on to say. For if you sow to your flesh, you of the flesh are going to reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, then of the Spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. Or as Paul put it, Paul said, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Again, it starts with our focus. Actually, you could say not really our focus. It starts with a thought, 
And then what we do with that thought is going to determine what we're going to focus on. In other words, if we embrace that thought, then what's that going to do? That's going to take our focus in whatever direction it's going to take our focus. And through that focus, we're going to be sowing seeds into our life, okay? And they can either be seeds of the Spirit, which will reap life and peace, or they can be after the flesh, which is, which is going to be of no profit. In other words, we're going to have to do all the work to try and get any gain. And that gain is not guaranteed. It's generally just a carrot on a stick. And that the closer we get to it, the farther that carrot seems to move out away from us. So we have to be diligent in what are we placing our attention on? What are we looking at that's so important because that is going to take our focus. Let me let me read you a scripture. It's Jesus is Jesus uses this phrase in many different places in the scriptures. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 17. And in this context that he's using this phrase, he's talking about the last days. He's talking about the time previous right immediately before his return. And he's using this phrase to relate uh, to the people this principle that I'm sharing with, with us today. And I'm going to just jump right in the middle of it. It's ta- uh, the, the theme here is Jesus is talking about when the kingdom of God is actually going to come onto the earth. And so he talks about many things, the days of Noah, you know, this, that, and the other. And then he goes on down, like compares it with Sodom. And then he says in verse 30, he says, even thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back to get his stuff. And then listen to what he says remember Lot's wife. What did Lot's wife do? See, she left with everyone, you know, mainly, I mean, with her husband and her daughters. Uh, They, you know, got out of town, but her heart did not go with them. In other words, when she was commanded not to turn back, her heart had never turned to run with her husband and her uh, children. She looked back, and when she looked back, what happened? Well, it says she became a pillar of salt. And notice the the, uh, phrase that Jesus uses in this context. He says, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Wow. Wow. This is an awesome principle that we should really understand uh, and, you know, just let it sink down deep into our heart. Do you know that if you're trying to preserve your own life, the reason you are is because you're focused on it. In other words, like, let's say, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, many people are very health conscious. In other words, they watch everything they eat. They only eat certain things. They only have a certain diet. They only drink certain things. They won't let other certain things in there. They won't do certain things. And why are they doing that? Okay. Well, they're trying to preserve their own life. They are thinking that unless they do that, they won't be okay. So their focus on their health is really on their ability. In other words, they're thinking that unless they do X, Y, or Z, they will not, will not be healthy. Now, that's a direct contradiction to the Word of God. How did their focus get off of what God says that He said, don't worry about your health. I'll bless your bread and your water, and, and if you get sick, I'll remove sickness and disease from the midst of you. Uh Exodus 23, 25. And he did that in the person of Jesus Christ. So think about this. You might be one of those health people that's got to eat certain things. And you know, I'm telling you what, folks, 
you can get to the point of watching your diet, your health, your food to the point where you won't even eat. Why? Because you're afraid. You're thinking, wow, if I don't know what to eat, so I'm just not going to eat anything. Now, that's completely your focus has moved you to make a decision that is not good for you. So again, like I said in the beginning, the enemy touches you with a symptom, and then he also tells you what you need to fix it. <laughs> there should be uh, what's wrong with this picture coming to your mind. There should be red flags flying up everywhere. If we're thinking the devil has got the solution to our problem, Folks, that is, that's just doesn't, that's an oxymoron, really. The devil, a solution to your problem. It's not a solution to get you out. It's a solution to get you so entrenched in it that you can't see the truth that God has provided for you in Jesus Christ. That's the goal. See, that's why the enemy draws us into works or performance or looking after the flesh, because the minute you're there, your faith is made void. Uh, read this scripture with me again. I use it a lot because we need to hear it a lot. It's in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Listen to what this says. It says, it's talking about the promise, that it was a promise. It wasn't a work or a performance. It was a promise made to Abraham and to all of us that uh, we would that uh, through faith we would have righteousness, not through our works or our performance. And notice what it says. For if they which are of the law or works or performance be heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made of none effect. Wow, think just for a moment, consider that. The minute you start working to obtain something, the, the grace and the favor and the free is moved out of it. See, and, and many people struggle with this. They say, well, well, you got to believe to be saved or you got to believe to be healed. No, you just, through your belief, you're cooperating with something God has already provided for you. You're not working or performing for it. You're just choosing to agree with God that this is the best thing for you. And through that belief, you're taking what's already been provided. You're not having to perform for it. That's why I use the word cooperation, because cooperation is uh, being in agreement with something that's already been accomplished. And that's where our focus is so important. And the enemy knows that. So if he can get you into Okay, yeah, you're healed by the stripes of Jesus, but you need to confess the scriptures. You need to quote this, this, and this. And if you don't, oh, then you won't get it. Because faith without works is dead. And you got to do something or it's dead. You're not really believing. So if the enemy can get you on, on that, you know, folks, that's a roller coaster. That's a, that's a, a, a circular ride. You're going up and down a lot but you're ending up in the same place you started, going round and round and round. How profitable is that? Well, right there, that should tell you. If what you're trying over and over and variations or varieties of it is not producing the fruit that Christ has provided for you, then let me just save you some time and effort. Just get off that circular ride. Get off the roller coaster. Just, it's not fun. Just get off. Just get off. Just stop. Say, I'm all, I went off this ride. In Jesus' name, I'm off this ride. But you can't just get off the ride like that. If you've spent a hundred revolutions around it, you're going to be dizzy with that. What you need to do is focus on something else. Do you know that that's how they tell you if you're uh, to avoid being seasick is to focus on some fixed object that's not moving up and down with the boat. And it keeps you from getting all, you know, uh, seasick. Well, we, God has given us something where we can focus on, but it's not something we can see in the sense with our natural eyes. 
Do you know, <clears throat> go with me to Matthew chapter 12. I think this is, this is so awesome how Jesus did this. In, in Matthew 12, Twapta, Matthew chapter 12, <laughs> Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 38. Listen to this. It says, then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So here again is that same trap that the enemy's setting them up with. He's saying, look, if he'll show you a sign, then you can believe. So but what happens when you see the sign? Do you think if you if seeing us if you need to see a sign to believe, do you think that sign is really going to help you? No, because when you see that sign, you're going to doubt it anyway because it's not going to be the perfect sign. It's not going to be the one that you need to see. It might be a sign to somebody else, but it's not going to be the one you need because if you're responding to the thoughts of the enemy to see a sign, then when you see the sign, the enemy is going to say, well, he's going to bring up everything in the world about why that's not a sign. And listen to how Jesus answered these folks. It is so awesome. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. He said, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, he gave them a sign that they wanted to see. Now, did any of them say, oh, well, thanks. Now we know you're the Christ. We believe on you. No, not one of them said that. Do you know why? Because not one of these people was alive when Jonah was alive. And do you know that no one saw Jonah in the belly of the whale? No one. Just God and just Jonah. That's it. So if you're going to believe to receive, you have to look at something you cannot see with your natural eyes. Stop a minute, folks. This is an important point. Don't just run over this. Really, I'm being so uh, sincere with you because this is what this is what breaks the chains that are hurting us. Okay, that's why I titled it: Our focus can hurt us, or it can help us. It can heal us, or it can make us sicker. It's so important our focus, and I'm going to read some scriptures on that. But think about this. Jesus gave them something to focus on that if they would focus on that, they they couldn't see it with their natural eyes. They would have to go to the Word of God and they would have to choose to believe that the account about Jonah being in the belly for three days and three nights actually happened. You know, when when Jonah went to Nineveh, he didn't preach to everyone. Hey, God just delivered me from the belly of the whale. I was in there for three days and three nights. They would have looked at him like, well, you smell like rotten seaweed, but you ain't been in no belly. You can't be in a belly of a whale. They don't eat meat, you know, just whatever. They wouldn't have believed him. Okay, but what did he preach? He preached the thing that God told him to tell the people because the people would then have through the the spirit of the words that they're sharing, if they listen to those words, it would give the spirit an opportunity to make real to their heart and mind what they cannot see with their natural eyes. Did you catch that, folks? Do you know, no one saw Jesus in the heart of the earth. No one saw Jesus in hell, uh, bearing our sicknesses, our diseases, our sins. No one saw him being judged. Do you know, that's why God hung him on a tree, to show you where he was going when you couldn't see him anymore. Not that he was going to die and go into a grave. God hung him on a tree for a reason. Galatians 3.13 says he was hung there to do what? To show that he was cursed of God. 
And it tells us that the cursed are wicked and they are cut off and they go into a place of separation that the Bible calls hell. Luke, uh, Luke 16 is a perfect example of that, an, Ill, uh, an account of where, where you go after you die. So think about this for a minute, folks. Jeez, they're asking for a sign because they say, if only I saw, then I would believe. <laughs> Jesus said, my father knows that a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. So he only gave them one sign that would free them from being wicked and adulterous. And that was the sign of Jonas the prophet. It was something they couldn't see. Okay, they had to go to the word and open their heart to embrace that what that was saying was true. Just that simple point of decision. I'm going to focus on what God is saying happened over what my flesh and the devil is telling me. And once you believe that, then it's not difficult for you to believe that Jesus went into hell for three days and three nights. And when he rose again, he was free from all of that. Just like Jonah, when he rose, when he was spit out of the belly of the whale, he was free from all the separation that he had been separated for his own sin. Wow, these folks, these are important points. And why are they important? Go, go, to, uh, go to Matthew chapter 6. Listen to what he says in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He says, No man or woman or child can serve two masters, for he, he, were, he will either hate the one or he'll be opposed to one. Remember our, our last few lessons on stop opposing your healing? He'll either oppose the one and love the other, or he will hate the one and love the other. He says, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's, let's just stop for a second. What is this talking about? This is the same principle that we're talking about right now. You cannot focus on your flesh and what the devil's telling you about it and focus on what the Word of God is saying to you in that moment. You cannot. You can switch back and forth really quickly because we have that ability, but you'll still be divided. He's saying you can't focus on what my Word says is true about you because if you do, you're going to have to oppose the contrary thought, okay? But if you're focused on what the devil's telling you about your situation, your symptom, your circumstance, then you can't focus on what God has told you about it. It's a simple principle. And, and this is why it's so important to guard your heart with all diligence on what you're going to allow yourself to look at. Take, for example, you have that symptom and you go to the doctor. Are you prepared to hear everything that he might tell you? Are you prepared? Is your heart ready to keep its focus on what God says about you, regardless of what he points you to? See, you have to have your heart fixed, trusting in God, Psalms 112. That's what's going to keep your heart from... Uh, distress or from evil or from being overtaken. Very, 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 very important. L let me give you an example of this. Go with me to Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. In, uh, in Numbers 14, these are the children of Israel. Okay? They've seen one miracle after another. Okay, signs and wonders. They're seeing them almost on a daily basis. God's taking care of them. Okay, they were delivered out of Egypt. Go back and read all the things that the Israelites saw God do. And then they walked through the very first aquarium ever made on dry ground. And they watched that aquarium collapse and destroy 
the Egyptian army. They watched all that happen with their own eyes. And the most formidable army force in the world at that time were the Egyptians. And they watched God destroy them with one, with one lowering of the rod. When Moses put his rod down, they were, they were destroyed. They saw all that with their eyes, their physical eyes. Okay? Now, here they are. It's in the second year <clears throat> of their coming out of Egypt. Now, they've been belly aching, moaning, and complaining the whole way. Okay? But God promised them that he was taking them to a land flowing with milk and honey. So he takes them to the southernmost most border of the land of Israel. And he must, he must have realized that these people are really discouraged. Okay? So the spies, they go spy out the land, and they're going to come back, and they're going to tell them, this is exactly what God said. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's get our butts in gear and take this whole land. I'm tired of dragging my feet out in this desert, okay? So the spies go out for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? And then when they're coming back, they come to this place called es Escal, okay? And they cut down one cluster of grapes that is so big, it has to have two men carry it with a stick between them, okay? They come back. And they're telling all the people, wow, this is an awesome land, just like God said. It is flowing with milk and honey. Let me pick it up there. I'm in uh, chapter, well, let me go to 13, okay? And I'm going to start in verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Wow. So just like the scribes and Pharisees were asking Jesus for a sign and he gave them a sign, did, did that sign help them at all? Not one of them said, oh, well, of course you are the Messiah. No, not one of them said that. They continued to doubt. You know why? Because they really did not believe the scriptures. They did not believe that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. See, they truly didn't believe that. They had some other philosophy about it, like the world has today. I'd tell you a joke about that, which is really funny, but it would take away from the time I have with you. In verse 27, it says, And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. They're giving a report to the whole congregation. Can you hear the whole congregation going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're all excited about it. Okay. It says in verse 28, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of the An Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by sea and by the coast of Jordan. Can you see this is just going downhill from there? What have they done? These people giving the report have now taken these people that are focused on what they're saying over what God said. See how this report has moved their focus away from what God has said to the natural realm. But here, God is faithful. God is always going to bring another voice into our lives that's going to speak the truth and remind us of what He sees in our situation. If we'll choose that voice, it will bring deliverance. Listen to what Caleb says. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. See, he was saying, Stop focusing on what they're telling you. Let's just focus on what God said about us. He said, We are well able 
to take the land. So let's go take the land. Let's do it. Yay, yay, yay. And where was Caleb's focus? He saw the same people. He saw the same walls. He saw the same giants. But he also saw something that he didn't take out of his view. In other words, everything that he saw in the land, he looked through the lens of his father, of you know God our Father's word. What did God say? God say, I'm giving you that land. God told them already before they ever left, I'm giving you the land of the Jebusites, the, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergesites. That's all going to be your land. I know they're there, but that's going to be your land. Okay? They were excited. But now when they have people coming back and painting a picture to them of something evil, what do they choose to believe? Well, listen to what God says here. Uh, Verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we aren't able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. Wow. Right before everyone. They said this before the whole congregation. Listen to what God said. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great statue. And we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Think about that for a minute. What were these men focusing on that gave them this view? They weren't focusing on what God said. They were focusing on what the enemy was telling them about what they were seeing with their natural eyes. That's what he was doing. Our... Do we do the same thing? When you have that symptom in your body, are you focusing on what the enemy's telling you about it? What the doctor report said about it? Or are you focused on what God said about it? What he has already provided for you concerning it? Are you going to let that symptom be one one of the 10 spies and cause your heart to be discouraged? to where you don't want to go up, where you want to go back to something that God has delivered you from? Is that what you want to do? Well, folks, there's an answer. There is a solution to that. And I'm torn here whether I should share that solution right now or whether I should uh, stop here and start a new study. But uh, you know what? I'm with you. I want to hear it too. <laughs> so we're going to go there. Turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4. You know, folks, I was in that place. Man, I had the. T- I felt like I was living with the 10 spies, not because of my wife, but because I was constantly focused on the 10 spies, the cancer that was constantly talking to me. Okay? It wasn't really the cancer. It was the devil and all of his hosts talking to me about it. And he would use people. Yeah, everyone that saw me would say something to me about, oh boy, it's, yeah, it's really bad. (laughs) Yeah, have you, uh, you got life insurance? You know, they'd ask me all these kind of questions, you know? Uh, Boy, uh, man, does... You know, they have all these questions. I don't need to go into those. But I'm just saying, the devil had his 10 spies. Well, let me put it this way. The devil will bring his 10 spies into your life whenever you will receive them. You know, um, I uh, I can't remember who it is, but I heard someone call the media, uh, call them the, the 10 spies network. <laughs> I love that. That's all you hear on mainstream media is the 10 spies. You don't hear the two that had a sober mind 
and were focused on things they couldn't see and looking at the things they could see through what they couldn't see, which was the word that God gave them. And boy, I went, I was chasing my tail for eight years. It wasn't until I was completely exhausted and could, and realized that the tail was attached to me that I quit ta- chasing it. I already had it. You know what I mean? So, uh, and this verse, this verse here was one verse that helped me so much to break that vicious cycle uh, on that, okay? Listen to, I'm in Proverbs chapter four, did I say? And I'm in verse 20. It says, my son, give attention to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Do you know what? This is exactly what Caleb was saying to those people. Wait, don't stop. He was saying, no, give attention to what God said. Let's stretch out our ear to hear his plan on how we're going to take that land. We can do it. That's what he was saying. But what, what, what were they hearing? They were hearing the 10 spies. They were hearing the 10 spies tell them, no, we'd be better off to turn and and go back to Egypt. But is that true? Well, listen to what this goes on to say. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Wow. You know what this is saying? Don't take your focus off of what my word is saying to you. This is the solution, folks, right here. Just like Jesus told him, well, go to the Word, read about Jonas. He's the sign that you'll need to believe. Listen to this. It goes on to say, uh, don't let them depart from your eyes. Don't take your focus off of what God is saying to you. Keep what He's saying to you in your heart. You know, it goes on to say, In verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. That's why he's saying what God says about your circumstance and your situation, don't take your focus off it. In other words, let your heart be so intently connected to what his word has said that you can't see anything else that comes into your view without looking at it through what God has said about it. Boy, that, that, folks, is a, it, Jesus worded it like this, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Knowing is not just having an intellectual uh, assent to something. Knowing is where it's in your heart, where you are looking at everything through that understanding, and that's going to be freedom to you. Amen? But it can work in reverse. Remember, I said The title was, our focus can either heal or hurt you, okay? How can it hurt you? If you're focusing on anything other than what the Word says about your circumstance or your situation, that's just going to be sowing more death into you. Can you imagine the picture that these children of Israel had in their mind when uh, the uh, 10 spies gave them that evil report? Wow! Well, they they went on to say, let me read what they said. I probably quit reading there too soon, but in verse 14, listen to what they said. Uh, Chapter 14, verse 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would have, or we would have died in this wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us up into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Wow. One statement. One probably took 10 minutes for the, the spies to you know, share all that evil report. And their hearts are completely turned away, thinking they're going to, people are going to kill them with a sword. All their children are going to be slaughtered. Who painted that picture for them? That was the devil. And the devil used those 10 spies to do what? To destroy their faith or confidence in what God said. 
I'm telling you folks, that's why God gave us his word for us to focus on something that is true and lovely, that's a good report, that has praise and virtue. This is what we should be thinking on. This is what we should have guarding our heart is this word. Listen to what he says. He says, don't take your focus off of what I'm saying to you, verse 20, <clears throat> 21, but keep what I'm saying to you in your heart. Treasure that above everything else. He says, and this is why we should do it. For that, what God is saying to us is life to those that find it and health to all their flesh. Wow. This finding here is like the knowing that Jesus used in John chapter 8. When you find the life that's in that word, why would you let go of it? Why You wouldn't. Because when you find that life, you found the Spirit of God. And that Spirit of God is health to all of your flesh. It's health to your mind. It, it, is, it is awesome. Let me go, go with me over here to um, Proverbs chapter 3. It's making the same point over and over. And I think that's important for us, that we need to hear it over and over. Listen to chapter 3 of Proverbs, verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. He's saying the same thing. Don't let go of having that word before your eyes. Do you know in the Old Testament, it, it tells us in Deuteronomy 6 that we should uh, be talking about the word when we get up, when we go to bed, when we're walking during our day, when we're working, when we sit down to eat, and when we go to bed, we should have that. And it calls it, we should have it as frontlets before our eyes. In other words, it should be something that you're always focused on, that you're seeing everything through that. It'd be like these, this pair of glasses. I see everything that I'm looking at through the glasses, okay? And Th that changes the focus of what I'm looking at, okay? It makes it more crystal clear at a distance, okay? Listen to what this says. He says, my son, forget not my law. In other words, don't take your focus off what my word has said. He says, but let your heart keep that word. Don't let it depart from it. Why? Because it's going to take you a lot of time. It's going to be trouble for you. You're, you won't be able to do other things that are so important. You, you'll have to get up early. You'll have to go to bed late. You'll have to spend time in his word. Listen to what it does. Listen carefully. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. How many of you are sick of that? How many of you have too much length of days? You don't want to live a long life and you don't want any peace. How many of you have so much of that you don't need any more? I didn't see one hand raise. That's awesome. Praise God. We need this, folks. We need the Word. God didn't give us the Word to confine us or limit us. He gave it to us to expand our life, to allow us to experience the fullness of why Jesus Christ came and rose again for us. That's why I gave it. Listen to this. I'm going to read a few verses here. Go on in chapter 3. Listen to verse 13. It says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Why is he happy? For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. Wow. That's awesome. What is wisdom? What is understanding? Does it, is it talking about, you know, becoming a mathematician or, or a, uh, you know, uh, expert in history or uh, an expert in, you know, you name any field, science, whatever. Is that the wisdom and understanding he's talking about? No. He's talking about the wisdom and understanding that God used to create the world. Those weren't based on natural laws. Those were based on spiritual laws that you can only understand through the Spirit of God. And the words Jesus said that we're reading here, he said these words are spirit and their life. That's why we want to get them on the inside of us. It goes on to say, it says, length of days 
Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 15. She, wisdom, understanding, it says she is more precious than rubies and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared to her. Wow. Length of days is in her right hand and riches and honor in her left hand. Do you see that the spiritual knowledge, wisdom, understanding, the word of God that God has for us can actually provide riches and honor for you? You can't get those from the world, not without great effort on your part. These riches and honor that God has are given to us freely through the work that Jesus Christ has done for us, not for what we will do or won't do. How simple. Why would we want our heart focusing on anything else? It's just going to take us to something we need to do or start doing or keep doing or, you know, get done in order to be okay. But that's not true. Jesus did it all. Listen to it. It goes on to say, her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Do you know what I discovered when my focus gets on something like, you know, a symptom in my body or a, or a problem or a circumstance that's arisen in my life, you know, I realized that right away, my peace is just like out the window. And I, I, come to value that peace. So I just, when I feel that peace subsiding or going down, I realize that my focus has moved away from truth to a lie, from truth to something that is in this world or in this flesh that's going to pass away anyway. It doesn't need me to focus on it. It's going to pass away anyway. It goes on to say, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. You know, that's a good point. We might hear the truth on a great sermon or a message, you know, but are we gonna are we retaining it? The way you retain it is by focusing on it, by letting attending to that that word that you're hearing stretching out your ear to hear how it applies in your case, in your situation, in your life, and then staying focused on it. That's how you retain it. It goes on to say, the Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding he hath established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down dew. My son, my daughter, my friend, let not them depart from thine eyes. Wow, God is really serious about where we should have our focus. He keeps telling us, don't take your eyes off of or don't focus on anything other than what I'm telling you. Because I, I'm, I know how it all works. <laughs> I made it. I know how it works. I can make it work for you. Okay? Don't focus on anything else. Okay. And then listen to what he says. My son, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. In other words, don't let that pass away. Don't hold on to it like we read earlier and listen to the benefit. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shall thy walk safely and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. You know, I can't tell you folks how many people I minister to, and you you might be one of them, who have trouble falling asleep or who have trouble sleeping. And they all say, oh, it's because I was on the computer too late or I was on my phone too late. No, it's because of this, your focus. Your focus is on something that's keeping your heart from being at peace, to where you're not afraid, to where you know that you can lay down and sleep, that God's in control, that God is faithful to all that he has done for us in Christ. And if we fall asleep, it's still going to be fine. It's not going to pass away. Like it says in Psalms 119, I think it's 89. Let me read that. I'm going the wrong way. 
Uh, Psalms 119.89 uh, says, <clears throat> Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thy ordinances. See, God established laws, and they won't go away. Why? Because God established them. And he did them according to his wisdom and his understanding. And that cannot go void. In other words, we can put our confidence in God, stay focused on what he says, and know that we're going to be safe. And what's that going to do? Well, you'll have peace, folks. You'll be able to lay down and sleep. You won't be waking up and your mind immediately start thinking about what you forgot or didn't do or needed to do or should have done or hadn't done or whatever else the enemy is trying to tell you to keep you from having that sweet sleep. Amen? So, folks, I'm, I'm just going to cut it off there. <laughs> I mean, I could talk well into the new year about this subject because it is such a beautiful and timely uh, message. We could talk about it every day. It would be a timely message. So I'm going to pray for us, okay? Father, in Jesus' name, Father, we all need help with our focus. Father, our focus is our choice. Father, I thank you for being faithful to bring us your choice and to always be reminding us of the choice that you have for us to have life and peace and health and abundance. Father, I thank you for helping us to choose to focus on that. As you told the children of Israel, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. Father, today, help us. We choose life. Help us to stay focused on that life to the exclusion of all other information. Father, we thank you for being with us. And in Jesus' name, I just speak right now, blessing over this new year for everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, folks. Well, thank you for joining me. I look forward to getting together with you again next week for a true stream at 9 a.m. Thursday on at, uh, yeah, 9 a.m. Mountain Time. So bless you and look forward to seeing you again. Mm -hmm.